Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bruce Wingus, president of the Cuyahoga Valley Photo Society, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation uh, by Mike Ash on photographing the Milky Way and other night subjects. Um, just have a few things to share before we get um, before we get started with our program tonight. We're happy to announce that the Photo Society is resuming in-person photo walks and programming. Um, the past two years have been a strain on all of us as we've done all we can to remain safe during the pandemic, but we also all miss uh, getting together and seeing each other in person, and, and so we're happy to resume that. Uh, the past two years have shown us also a couple of ways to do things differently. Um, the photo walks will have an in-person day as we used to do, but we're also going to extend the, the time for the photo walks as we've done recently for a couple of week periods. So if you can't join us for the in-person day, you still have a couple of weeks after that to go ahead and go to a location and shoot some pictures. Um, we also are having an in-person program starting next month. Um, and it will be who? It will be uh, Gabe Leity, 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 I'm sorry. Um, and that will be an in-person program. We're going to have a potluck before that. That'll be out at Happy Days. Uh, and the program will be at 7 o'clock. And the potluck will be before that. And so we're looking forward to seeing folks in person. Um, and you can check our Facebook page. And for those of you who are members, uh, you can check your email. And we'll have details about those events coming up. Um, and if you're not a member of the Photo Society, why not? It's never too late to join, never too early to join. Go ahead and, and, and join us, and uh, you can get information about joining the Photo Society through the Cuyahoga Valley Conservancy website or our own website at cvps.org. Uh, that's enough for me. I'm going to introduce you to uh, Steve Ash, our Director of Pro or Vice President for Programming, um, who's going to um, introduce our speaker tonight. And Steve, I've noticed you both share the same last name. Can you tell us what's up with that? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. I can remember when... Uh... Uh, a person that my parents met on the corner decided to buy this child named Mike, um, and he's been a part of our family since then. Um, so I am happy to introduce my little brother, Mike Ash. He, uh, he's the one that's not as good looking as I am, um, but he's not a bad photographer. I would like to tell you that I taught him everything he knows about photography. Um, however, I can't really do that since I actually learned a lot from him. I do remember when we were very little and my dad was a photographer and developed film and things. And I remember my brother going out with him and even working on a pinhole camera for like a Boy Scout merit badge. And he got serious ever since then, since he was a kid. And I, I started getting serious in the last, I don't know, 15 to 20 years. And so I've learned a lot from him. Mike is a primary a landscape photographer. He sells an awful lot of work, and most of the things that people love him for relate to night photos, Milky Way, in addition to some of his other landscape photos. So um, I also need to point out that it was the, the, uh, the society's subcommittee on presentations and programs that decided to bring him in. So I don't want to look like I'm just kind of give time to my brother, even though he is an outstanding photographer. So I just want to make that clear. Um, so with that, let me hand it off to Mike Ash and let's see what we can learn about Milky Way and night photography. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Bruce. Um, very nice to be invited to this. It's uh, quite an honor and I'm excited about it. Um, so I, I'm a, a Zoom neophyte. And so bear with me as I hopefully work this properly here. So I'm sharing my screen now, I hope. Good, great. Okay. So yes, I, I'm excited to talk about my uh, nightscape photography, Milky Way photography, and uh, I guess kind of the workflow that I do uh, when I'm shooting these things. And I, I do need to point out that, uh, oh, here's, forgot about this. So, so there's some of my links. If anybody's uh, interested, it's uh, where my website is, Instagram. I've got a QR code that takes it to Linktree that goes to uh, the various different um, sites that I have linked up on there. And then my email address in case somebody needs to get a hold of me for some reason. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, nightscape photography, not necessarily uh, astrophotography. You know, the difference being that um, in astrophotography, you have to have a tracker for you know, 
deep sky objects and I have friends that do it and get some marvelous photos, uh, but that's not what I'm going to be discussing today. Um, for nightscapes, it, it's basically a type of landscape. In fact, um, you know, I try to look as, at the night sky as if it were a sunrise or sunset. That's an element or component of the photo. It's not just the uh, Milky Way by itself. And so um, just like you'd shoot a sunrise or sunset with some sort of you know, foreground, something in, that ties to the uh, sunrise or sunset, same thing with the Milky Way. And I'm gonna focus strictly on Northern Hemisphere because um, can't cover everything and I've never shot some in the Southern Hemisphere. And so Northern is all I know. So we'll start off by talking about uh, where to shoot. Um, obviously, you need some place with dark sky. Uh, the lower the light pollution, the darker the sky, the more you're going to be able to capture out of the sky. And so I'm listing here a couple of different uh, resources that you might use to look um, up to see where dark sky is around you, or if you're traveling somewhere, there is an app called Dark Sky Finder, and it shows no, actually a lot of places that you can find. And then there's the International Dark Sky Association, which you can go to online as well. And uh, to brag a little bit, since I live in Utah, this was an article in the uh, um, Salt Lake Tribune uh, last year, where it said, including national parks, Utah is home to a total of 21 dark sky places out of a list of 90 around the world. So we have the highest number of dark sky in, in, uh, from any state in the United States. So I, I ha I'm in a blessed opportunity to shoot a lot of different places. So Milky Way season, you know, when's the bit? So you want a dark sky, but when is the best time to shoot? Well, technically the Milky Way is visible all year long. Um, here's a shot that I took, and this, this was actually during what I would normally call Milky Way season, but you can see the Milky Way on here. Uh, this is down in Kanab, Utah, but what most people, when they talk about Milky Way season, they're talking about the core. So this is a picture I took uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it's the bright spot kind of off to the right of this hoodoo. That's the galactic center of the core, and that's... Um, what most people usually envision in capturing their Milky Way shots. But like I said, it's not necessary. But the core, there is a season in Northern Hemisphere where that core is more visible. So again, strictly Northern uh, Hemisphere. From approximately October or November, depending on where you're at, to roughly January, February, the Milky Way core is below the horizon. Um, and, you know, you any... At, it's up during daylight hours, basically, so you can't see it. Um, so as, as you actually go higher north um, from the equator, the Milky Way core is lower and lower to the horizon, so it can extend out that October, November, January, February part. And so for me in Utah, the Milky Way season starts usually late February and ends you know, kind of in mid-October. And uh, you can see that from roughly late February in that period, that's when it's raised up. And here it's going to be a little bit higher. And, and again, trying to tie in a you know, component of a leading line just in a, in a um, kind of a standard composition to tie into the Milky Way. Uh, so this is typically when I'm out shooting as much as possible. So that leaves us basically spring, summer, and fall as the seasons uh, that I'm able to shoot. And probably for you guys, going to be pretty close to that too, unless you like to travel somewhere south or, or go you know, much further north. So the Milky Way core changes with the Earth moving. It changes where it's going to be rising. In spring, it's going to be a little more to the southeast. By summer, it's pretty typically due south and then fall, it moves over to the Southwest. So you kind of, you're looking always to the South, but a little bit different angles, depending on the time of uh, year. So let's talk about the spring and fall, since those are, are very similar in some of the aspects of, of, of what you can do during the shooting season. So like spring, you, first of all, one of the big advantages is that the entire Milky Way, like I said, is, it's close to the horizon, um, that's the bad part in any earlier months, but it's close to the horizon, which means that you get, you're able to get these panos with the Milky Way arch above it, such as this one here. This one I think I shot actually in May. It's a, a very famous place in Canyonlands called Mesa Arch. Um, there's a lot of daylight shots there, but you can get the full arch over Milky Way 
uh, in a panoramic shot, which is what I took here, if you do it early in the season. So that's one of the advantages of spring. Here's another shot, which was the uh, cover one that I uh, did for this presentation. Uh, this is in Death Valley, and uh, they have these uh, salt flats out there and able to do, you know, this was probably about a seven to eight shot panoramic and, and very close to uh, sunrise, which I'm gonna talk about in a second here as well. So the, for both spring and fall, and spring is typically where you're gonna be able to get the arch, not necessarily in fall, but they have, like I said, some similar advantages, including the opportunity for blue hour blending, um, which we're gonna talk about a little later on in this presentation. And it's also cooler. And so there's less risk of thermal noise, which I'll come back to and talk about as well. Because it's cooler, it sometimes is uh, extremely cold. So be prepared. Uh, you know, any if you've done any kind of night hiking photography, you, you know it can start off you know warm during the day and get colder at night. So this is a, a ghost town that I shot in southern Idaho a few years ago, and when I left the house, I was wearing tennis shoes, and uh, my late wife she's she's like, aren't you going to be wearing boots? And I'm like, no, this is a, it's a ghost town. There's, there's sidewalks and roads and stuff. And I, so, you know, I should be fine. Well, you know, I should have listened to her. I always listen to your wives. And uh, I ended up standing in probably, you know, two to three feet of snow at, at about five degrees trying to get the shot. Uh, and my toes were numb by the time it was over. So, uh, yeah, be prepared if you're going to go out in this season that can, you know, obviously be really cold once the sun goes down and get the Milky Way. But this again, very close to sunrise. And because it's cold, the other drawbacks you're gonna have is uh, your batteries are gonna drain faster and you can get lens fog. Um, in fact, sometimes it's even a good idea if you shoot with a UV filter to take that off, that can just exasperate the problems. Um, and like I said, definitely pack warmer clothes. The, there's a shorter window for shooting. So that's gonna be one of the downsides because like I said, the Milky Way is starting to rise uh, just before sunrise. Uh, in the fall, it's a little bit sooner than sunrise. So you have a little bit more time to shoot, but again, fairly narrow window of shooting. So Southeast again in the spring, Southwest in the fall and much shorter windows to so be prepared to uh, try to crank out as many shots as you can uh, during those seasons. Summer shooting, it's going to be pretty close to due south, and that's going to be June to early August, and not long after sunset, and, and the later that you go in the year, the, the later after sunset, uh, you'll start seeing that core. One of the nice advantages is you have a large window of opportunity for shooting, um, and I like shooting many times in the summer because I can shoot different locations. I can actually shoot one spot, drive to another spot, and still have the Milky Way to shoot, or sometimes um, just shooting different angles. And so you have a, a lot of time to experiment around when you do in the summer. Drawback is that you may get thermal noise because it's hotter outside. And that's a, basically gets a lot, you can get a lot more grain and not much chance of getting an arch because the, uh, the Milky Way is pretty much upright. So this is in the Uinta Mountains that I shot a couple of years ago and got a nice reflection uh, from this one as well. Um, but you can see there's really no way to get an arch out of something like this. So some of the things I might suggest for homework and legwork to make sure that you're at the right place at the right time. Obviously, as I mentioned before, you want to be somewhere that's dark sky, but there's more to it than that. So this is a, um, a satellite shot of the Great Salt Lake and the, uh, the island kind of near the, the bottom or slightly off center um, of the image here is Antelope Island near Salt Lake. And so that's one of the places that's designated as a dark sky location. So you think that'd be great for Milky Way shooting. So this next slide, and it kind of shows you how bad our, our water problems are here right now. It's not even really surrounded by water anymore, but you see Antelope Island and kind of Southeast of that is Salt Lake. And a lot of towns Southeast mostly and not too much Southwest, but it's not a great spot for shooting Milky Way because you have the city glow 
coming from the southern direction. And so you can get some Milky Way, but it really eats into uh, what you're able to see with the Milky Way and especially into the core. So even though it's a dark sky location, it, it's not a location that most people want to go to shoot Milky Way. You don't necessarily have to have the darkest skies. You can shoot if uh, you don't find a dark spot, a really super dark sky spot. So this one I shot um, just on the opposite side of the of the uh, Wasatch Mountain, what they call Wasatch Back, in a little town uh, called Eden. And there's a town not very far from there. And I was shooting this barn that had the uh, you know obvious um, flag painted on the side there. And I'm going to talk about how I light my subjects here in a little bit but I could I, there's a fence couldn't get close and I had a really hard time lighting this and there's traffic behind me on the road and so I just would wait for the car the right car to come by and light it up with its headlights and so uh, even with the headlights and a city not too far I was able to get these shots so there, there are ways to do it if you do a little bit of homework of you know how large the town is and where it's at which, which direction you're going to be shooting what's there Here's another shot that I uh, shot between Salt Lake and, and Wendover, Nevada. There's this bus that's out in the middle that it, it, people shoot for a lot of different things. And the outside of this bus was lit up from the lights of a gas station, probably a quarter mile away, maybe a little bit further. But just that little bit of light coming from there was enough to give the illumination the outside of the bus. Now I placed some lights in the inside to light it up but again it worked it worked to uh, my advantage so you know you try some things out if you see an area that's not completely dark sky you might still be able to get something and here's one that i shot outside of uh bryce canyon just i think it was the year before last and bryce canyon is a dark sky area but this was near uh what they call Ruby River Inn, and there's there's big hotels there and gas stations and shops and everything else. And uh, this is actually by uh, one of the main roads. And there was a shop not too far off to my left when shooting this. And that again is what, to a great degree, illuminated this old wagon sitting out there. And so I took advantage of the lights that were there and uh, still had a dark enough sky to shoot it. And again, a fence, so I couldn't get any closer to shoot it than this. And then, uh, I think this is the last one in this category here, but this is down in Kanab as well. And this is right before, uh, in fact, Blue Hour was starting. And so sometimes, even as Blue Hour starts creeping in, you can still catch the Milky Way if you're in an area that doesn't have a ton of light pollution. And I had a light down inside of this bowl. Um, we uh, tied it onto a rope and, and dropped it down so it could illuminate the sides of the walls. But the Milky Way itself, you know, that was able to come up and that's actually just daylight creeping into the blue hour from the side of it. Okay, so the, the one of the biggest things you can do to improve the homework of where you're going to be going is to use, you know, Google Earth and a couple of apps that I want to um, talk about here, because planning is a really important part of it. I mean, it's great to go out and drive and find a cool spot and get the Milky Way shot, but, you know, I, I don't want to drive four, six, eight hours and, you know, things don't line up like I had planned. So use Google Earth to your advantage. And there are some apps that I use very regularly. Um, so there's like a Google Earth uh, shot of uh, Delicate Arch. Very, It's the famous Utah Arch. It's on license plates and everything. It's kind of uh, designated there. So you can look to see which way is the arch facing. How is this going to work You know, for sunrise? Is there a big city nearby? What other lights might interfere with it? So if you do this all ahead of time, it can save you some headaches uh, when you get out into the field. And then the apps. So... If you've done anything with Milky Way, you're familiar with Milky Way photography, PhotoPills is the, the most you know, popular app. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that can do. But I think the app Planet Pro gets overlooked. And I actually have both of them. They're roughly 10 bucks a piece. And that's pretty much for a lifetime app. So they're really, I mean, it's, it's very inexpensive uh, expense. And it's available on Android and uh, for uh, Apples. And they offer tools that are just so useful in being able to shoot the Milky Way. So uh, I'm going to start with photo um, with Planet Pro first. So this is kind of some screenshots they had on their website and you can see some of the things and they use Google Earth as well. So you can see satellite views, but it'll show you 
where the Milky Way is rising, what time it rises, what angle, it, you know, where it's moving to. And one of the things that I find most useful from them is on the right side of the screen is their calendar. So you can type in any day in a week, a month, next year, and then scroll through and see what time dark sky starts, when the Milky Way rises, what the angle is going to be, um, you know, how much interference you might get from the moon. And, and like I said, just a, a wonderful app. And so I highly recommend it. Uh, and, and a lot of people haven't even heard of this one because they're focused on photo pills. And photo pills, that's one of the things that's very advantageous about that one is what you see on the screen of the right hand side there. It's called Night AR. It's augmented reality. And uh, it also has a planner in it that's, that's uh, pretty close to what you get with Planet Pro. But the Night AR, if you have this downloaded to your phone, you can walk out into a, a location and plug in a date and time when you'd like to be there and see where the Milky Way is going to be. And so you can actually line up the shot and know. And, and I've done this many times where I'll find something cool when I'm shooting daylight shots. And it's like, OK, I'm out here in, in March or April shooting. But if I move forward to July or August, you know, this Milky Way lines up perfectly with what I want to go shoot. So and you can actually even snap off a picture with what's in the background with the AR uh, laid over top of it. So you'd have a reference to pull up later on. So uh, fantastic tool. And PhotoPills also has a, a bunch of uh, different like calculators built in that uh, you can you know, calculate depth of field and uh, you know, um, time uh, for exposure, which we're going to talk about in a little bit here. So get both of those if you can. And then weather apps, you, you want to know what's happening. There's, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect weather app or weather station. We all know that, but uh, there's nothing worse than, again, driving somewhere specifically for Milky Way photography and it's storming and, you know, all cloudy. I mean, it's, it, you can shoot lightning and a bunch of other things, but you're not going to shoot Milky Way. So it doesn't even make sense to plan that if you, if you can check that ahead. And then one of my favorite apps is another one that's called Clear Outside. Now, this has a web page as well as an app, and it's free. And it will tell you what the cloud coverage is going to be. So here's a screenshot that I took of it here. And you can see, um, so Wednesday the 11th, so I just took this screenshot, whatever it was, a, a week ago, roughly here. And the top row under where it shows the Wednesday day 11th says total clouds and the percentage of the sky that's obscured. So we scroll across and we hit the zero hundred hours there at midnight, we see that it's 82% and it gets worse. So by four o'clock in the morning and five o'clock, it's hundred percent cloud coverage. You, you are not going to get a Milky Way shot there. Now, keeping in mind, this particular uh, screen grab is for May 11th. And so the Milky Way is, is low on the horizon and coming up right before sunrise. So at the ideal time that you want to shoot, you're not going to be able to see it. Nice thing is, though, too, that it gives you low clouds, medium clouds, and high clouds, because sometimes the clouds in the shot are not necessarily bad. If they obscure the, the core, you, you might you know, wish they'd move, and I've, sometimes I've just waited around for them to move, but you get them other areas of the shot, they, they can actually add a little bit of character to it. So if you have a little bit of coverage, it's not bad. It's the, it's the high clouds that are usually the bigger problem. But if you get some low clouds that are in there and just a little bit yeah, you might still want to give it a shot. Now, um, a word of warning on using this app, I discovered this the hard way, is that um, every time you restart it, at least on your phone, and maybe this is different on an Apple than, a, than an Android, but it puts the default coordinates of someplace in the UK in there. And so I've turned it on to look to put in the date and everything. It's like, wow, this looks great or this looks bad. It's like, it's not even for here, you know, because I would already plugged it in last time I used it and it returns to the spot in the UK. So make sure that you find where you're going. It, it will do a search for cities or sometimes for popular like locations like arches, uh, you know, national parks and stuff, but it doesn't have everything in there. But you can punch in coordinates, too. So if you know where you're going, you can plug that in. The other thing is that it does require... Uh, service. You have to have internet service. So if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're not going to be able to pull this up and use it because it's it's updating. I have found this app to be probably 90% accurate. Occasionally, it's been a little bit off. Um, and, and like any weather thing, you kind of have to check it as frequently as possible before you go out. But uh, it, it has really been a wonderful tool to use. So um, clear outside.
Other apps that I would suggest is uh, you have some sort of GPS device or uh, an app on your phone. I use Gaia, if that's how they pronounce it. And so that way, again, I can mark locations where I'm going to be. This particular app, it has a little bit like photo pills. You can, I can go out and find a hoodoo or a tree or a rock formation or a barn or something that I, that I think, okay, I pull up on photo pills, I take a picture, I look how it's going to look good, and then I'll mark it. And so I can find it again, because I may not be back until, you know, several more months, or it might be a year or two before I make it back to that location, but I know where it's at. So uh, another extremely useful tool. And then of course, the legwork. So not just homework, but the legwork, and that means going to the location. So here's a, a old building, I want to call it a barn. I think it's just a bunch of old buildings in Evanston, Wyoming that I shot a few years ago. I had ever, hadn't ever been out there before. And I went before the sunset so I could plan out where I was going to shoot and uh, what angles I was going to shoot. If I had not planned this out, I would have been in real trouble because even though I'm, it looks like I'm shooting into a wall, which I am, that's, you know, the scene in the Milky Way there, I'm actually inside what used to be the structure and any step to either in any direction blind, I would step on a rusty nail. So th this place had boards turned up all over the place, just littered with rusty nails everywhere. And in the, it seems like there's even some barbed wire. I mean, very dangerous for moving in there in the dark. And so I scouted out already in the daylight and I knew that if I wanted the shot, I would have to, you know, have a lot of lights on, pay very close attention to every step. And that's what I did when I, when I found a comfortable spot to shoot, I tried not to move and very conscious of, you know, if I'm moving left or right or change the angle. And a couple of times I was kneeling down to get the shot. Again, I have to shine my light, make sure I'm not setting my, uh, my hand on, on a nail somewhere. So you can check out if there's difficult access getting there, if there's uh, you know holes in the road or the trail or something blocking that. So another reason why it's important to go in the daylight. So you know, if you know, you can look at on Google Earth and say, okay, this is gonna be the perfect spot, perfect angle for shooting the Milky Way, but you all of a sudden arrive and there's you know all kinds of trouble that you might run into. So getting there ahead of time, I think is very important. Okay, and here's, again, another thing that you want to do again in the daylight is the night uh, augmented reality. So a big reason why uh, you want to scout that out first. And if you don't have either a GPS on your phone, I like to have a GPS with me of some sort to mark the location. So not just location of where it's at, but where do I turn off on the road? So when I first started shooting Milky Way, I didn't use this, and I'd find something off a beaten path and I'd say, okay, I just have to remember to turn, you know, right at this hill and then left at this gnarly tree and so forth and so forth. Well, you got out there on a moonless night in the dark, you can't find that hill anymore. You can't find that gnarly tree anymore. So I, I learned quickly that if I'm driving down the highway and I knew I have to turn off the road, I'm looking for a mile marker, something that reflects and some way to actually uh, note, and I'll do this with my GPS, this is where I turn off the road. And then, and then start a, a track if you have a GPS system. And again, this will do it in Gaia as well of how to get there in the daylight. So at nighttime, you can follow that trail. Um, this is a shot in Goblin Valley that I took a couple of years ago. It's the first time I was there. Uh, I arrived when it was um, already night. And uh, actually, I take it back. It was right at sunset. And so I got a couple of cool sunset shots off there. And I, and I found a few things that I thought, OK, this is going to be great. And then it started raining went to my car and waited out the rain for uh, an hour or two. And when I went back down, I, I found the spots I was wandering around because before I had GPS, I found them, got the shot, shots and couldn't find my way back to the car because it, it, I'm a ways away and I'm in this you know, unknown territory. So I'm wandering, I'm thinking, great, I'm gonna have to stay here till daylight in order how to get out of here. And I figured, okay, it's not a huge area. I'll just spend some time walking around. And I finally did, um, the car's parked up on a big hill and this is down below. And again, you can't see any of this in the dark. And I finally found the hill walked up and I was probably, uh, when I got to the top of the hill, maybe a quarter of a mile from my car, I head in the right direction. And then of course with flashlight, I may be able to see the uh, reflections off the car to find it. So, you know, keeping track of it, I, I, I have another shot. I don't have it here, but I was, uh, there's a place called Inchworn Arch and I uh, went with a friend and we actually marked his truck 
on the GPS. And we went down this hill to catch the arch, light it up, shot it. And we knew on the GPS where the truck was. The problem is that the terrain was so thick that we couldn't just go in a straight line. And so we're moving back and forth. And it took us you know, probably 10 times longer to get out of there than down because um, it is dark. And we, you know, we should have marked a path. That would have been much easier than just marking the spot itself. And, you know, if you don't have it, again, a GPS, have it on your phone, I always think it's very important to keep uh, the phone charged, not only for that reason, but it's an extra source of light. And of course, uh, you know, if there's some sort of emergency. Also, I, I always carry, and I probably should have uh, put a picture of it here, but uh, Garmin makes what's called an inReach, and it's a satellite texture. It's not a phone, but it has like a hot button. You can uncover it, and hit the uh, hot button that'll send out the rescue team if something happens. Um, you know, weird things can happen. You're out there in the dark and you know, trip and fall and break something. So it's nice to have, you know, any kind of safety tools with you. So phone charge, one of those. Okay, so let's quickly talk about some of the gear. Um, and, you know, I, I in my full-time job, I sell camera gear. These are the three brands that I sell, Nikon, Canon, Sony. I know there's Fuji and Panasonic and other ones out there. You really can't go wrong. As a rule of thumb, and, and this is not set in stone, but as a rule of thumb, if all other factors are equal, a full frame camera is gonna give you a cleaner image, especially with Milky Way. It's gonna collect light more easily. Um, and there is a point, a little bit of diminishing returns when you go the higher the megapixel. So for instance, I have an Nikon Z72 and a Z62, and I really shoot most of the stuff with a 72, but technically the Z62, it's less megapixel and those larger pixels will give it a little bit cleaner um, ISO when I'm shooting at those high ISOs. And so, you know, like I said, again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but you, you could, you know, do some checking on your camera. If you have multiple ones, find out which one's the, the best one for Milky Way and, uh, um, you know, either add it to your arsenal of, of tools or, you know, work with what you have in, in the parameters that will allow you to. And very important, of course, to have good glass that goes, I think, without saying with every uh, type of photography you're doing. So, Typically in nightscapes like I'm shooting, I'm shooting in wide angle or, or very close to wide angle. So I've owned 14 millimeter prime. I, I have actually the very center lens I bought not long ago. It's the 14 to 24 2.8. I like the zooms, even though they're not as bright because it gives me flexibility to, to either shoot at a, at a higher focal length to enlarge the subject and get the sky in there or get wider in to get uh, more of it in. So um, and I'll talk about maybe when to use each one of these, but prime lens is obviously going to have the advantage. You can get 1.4, 1.8, um, but then you don't have the zoom. And the other thing that's important to, to keep in mind is that not all, not, the sharpest of a lens is not always wide open. In fact, it's rarely at its widest opening. So I had a Sigma 1.8, 14 millimeter that I used to shoot, and it was great to be able to cut down on either the time or the ISO because I have the brighter aperture but it wasn't quite as sharp as if I set it at 2.8. And so then I'm, if I'm shooting 2.8, do I use my zoom or do I use the 14 millimeter? So, you know, pay attention to that and, and you can get little uh, problems with comb out to the corners when you're shooting, you know, some of these lenses wide open as well. Tripod, absolutely necessary. Uh, the sturdier the tripod, typically the better because I actually was down uh, in what they call the Badlands of Utah Hanksville area just a couple of weeks ago and it was so windy and I'm shooting these night shots you know 30 seconds and and I was very worried that my uh, shots were not going to turn out I have a very heavy duty tripod that I brought with me and it did a good job um, I haven't sifted through all my photos but at least I have some of them that were sharp enough that uh, I liked them um, I also carry a small backpacking tripod with me and I've used it for night shots but I try not to use the lighter one if possible unless I really have to hike in a long ways. And then, of course, a cable release or of some sort of wireless um, self-timer. On One of the things I like about my new Nikons, they have not just self-timer, but they have a delay firing. So it's kind of like a self-timer, but I can just set two seconds, you know, uh, touch the screen or hit the shutter release button, and then the vibration is gone by the time you shoot. But, uh, you know, make sure that you have something like that, just like any kind of long exposure in, in daylight photography. A couple of other things I bring with me, I always bring an extra quick release plate. You just never know uh, what's going to happen or if you lose it in the dark or whatever. Headlamp. 
you need to be able to find your way around and you want one that you can turn on a red light because that white light just ruins your night vision. And especially if you're somebody else and, or you may go someplace and there's a lot of other people around and boy, they will get mad at you if you're, you know, there with your bright white light ruining their night's uh, escape shots as well as your night vision. I do carry a flashlight with me because the headlamp, you know, is pretty much aiming where I'm looking, where I sometimes I need to get a look at the ground, you know, where my head's not pointing to make sure I'm not stepping on nails or snakes or something else. Uh, extra batteries, because again, in the cold, they're going to get sucked up. And I always try to bring extra like double A's for my headlamp and flashlight as well. And then gaffer tape. Um, and I'll many times wind that around with my tripod legs, but there's so many times when I needed to fix something. And so I have that attached as well. So here's one thing I discovered on my own that I have on my Nightscape uh, tripod, my heavy one, is I have glow-in-the-dark tape and reflector tape on there. So this next slide, it's kind of fuzzy. This is one that I just shot while I was in Hanksville. I thought, well, I ought to get a shot of this. You can see that I have the glow-in-the-dark tape on the leg on the left and the reflector below it and reversed on the other leg. Uh, obviously, it doesn't matter what's where. But the shot on the left is when all of a sudden I realized I needed this. So this is shot on the salt flats where they, uh, they do the races many times, the land speed, you know, races out not too far from Salt Lake uh, on the way to Wendover. And <laughs> if you go out after it's been wet, you will sink up to your axle in this stuff. But if it's been dry, you can drive across it and you have these really cool patterns that form out there. So I'm taking this shot and I have some lights set up, one on either side. And um, I had to keep adjusting them and because it really doesn't take much light. And so I would walk away from my can. And I, I have to pause this a moment and note that my car was parked and I wandered probably, you know, two, 300 yards away from the car before I found the pattern that I really liked and wanted to shoot. Once I set up my camera, then I went and set up the lights and more than once I'd go to adjust the light and then could not find my camera. It's in the dark. So I'm wandering around you know, where's my camera? Flashlight, doesn't matter, can't see it. And so I bought the reflector tape because the flashlight goes across it. And there it is, spot right there. And of course, the glow in the dark. So for some reason, you don't want to use the flashlight or it's going to disturb somebody else's night vision. So this works wonders. It's a wonderful investment. I highly recommend it. A couple of other things, you know, I mentioned about the GPS, a mosquito repellent, um, you know, small chair, because uh, if you're going to be there, you might be there several hours shooting. Nice to have a place to sit down, some water snacks and warm gear. Um, and it, it does get cold. In fact, uh, heading up to the Tetons later today, and uh, it's going to be in the low teens at the low, maybe even down to, I think I said 11 or 10. So definitely bring some cold gear because it's always colder at night. Um, oh, I showed that one. Mosquito repellent. Um, so the, here's a shot near Moab. I have a friend that has a side-by-side, -side, uh, you know, doom buggy type thing. And we went out there shooting and we marked the spots. We marked where his truck was with a GPS and we came back, back to the sand dunes to shoot. And when we set up our lights, it just drew in the bugs like crazy. And so we had lights, everything. So we would have to shut it off because we were getting covered with it. Well, fortunately, I had some bug repellent uh, in my backpack and put it on and it, it worked wonderfully. And so I always carry it with me now for that very reason, because it might seem great during the daytime, but at night you might get covered. Um, in some areas, and so for those people that uh, um, own guns, um, some people don't, you know, I, I try to bring something with me. Uh, going up to like Yellowstone, the Tetons, a gun's not gonna stop a, a bear, but bear spray hopefully will help. And I've been in, uh, in fact, this was when I shot in Yellowstone a few years ago and I'm by myself. And boy, that gets a little bit scary when you're out there by yourself and you hear some noises and you're away from the car, you're away from any lights other than the lights you've set up. And so I keep that bear spray close by because, uh, you know, people do get eaten out there. So it's, again, it's just a type of um, protecting yourself. You can see the glow in the light. That is from the lamps that I was using, not from anything that's natural. And again, a composition, we've got kind of uh, competing lines, one to the left of the Milky Way, one to the right with the smoke. Okay, so lighting gear we're gonna come back to, but let me talk about some of the other settings. First of all, turn off your image stabilization. If it's in your camera, you need to turn off there. On the lens, turn it off. Your, the image stabilization 
works by trying to find movement. So when it's locked in steady, it may look and actually cause the picture to get blurrier. So make sure that's shut off. If you have a DSLR instead of a mirrorless, good idea to cover the viewfinder because if, if you step back and you're using a cell phone for a timer, any kind of lights, it won't get in your shot, but it can leak in, in the, to the eyepiece and it can affect you know, a, a little bit what's going on there as far as you know, if you're doing any kind of other exposure uh, testing out on it. Um, and some people turn down their LCD brightness. I've tried that. Yeah, it kind of helps because when it's really bright, it, it can, can mess with your night vision and maybe give you an incorrect view of, of how bright the image is. Um, I don't find it to be a problem currently, but uh, if you're finding that you're not getting the exposure you thought it was, turn that down, it can help. Obviously keep the camera level. Um, it, most cameras have this built in now. And I usually start off at about 3,900 Kelvin as my white balance, I shoot everything in raw. And so I'm going to adjust it anyhow in post-processing. But that gives me at least kind of a, a pretty decent reference point um, where when I bring it up in Lightroom, it sets what I had shot. And, uh, you know, I can see if that's a good place to go for starting. Focusing. This is probably one of the toughest uh, ones because you're not going to really focus your lens at infinity. So here's a lens that I used to own on my DSLR. And you look, that line is infinity on both of them. Well, one of these is not going to be sharp. How do you know which one it is? So focusing is one of the biggest challenges for most people getting into nightscape photography because you can't just set it there and expect it to be tack sharp on the uh, stars. So there's several different ways to do this. You can manually or autofocus in the daylight. And so before the sun goes down, pick a mountain or, or something as far away as you possibly can and either auto or manual focus on it, then turn it to, to uh, you make sure it's locked on manual. And I've put gaffer tape on there before, lock down that focusing wheel so it's not gonna change. Um, the other way is to find something in the night, either moon if there's a sliver of it out or planets or bright stars and manually focus in on that. Um, now the trick to doing it at night is you have to zoom in, now not the lens zoom in, but the LCD. So find the brightest thing you can find in the sky and then use your magnification on your LCD to center it and then focus on it. If you have peaking in your camera, focus peaking, that's a great way to adjust it. If not, you want the smallest dot. As you change manually focus, you'll see that enlarge and so you know that's not sharp. And so you kind of have to adjust it. And, and it requires, like I said, a lot of fiddling around. And then of course, make sure you take some test shots and zoom in on the playback to make sure that they are sharp. Um, if you're using a zoom lens, try not to change the focal length because on some lenses that may change how the it's affecting where you've set the focus you know and then once i have it focused in and everything sharp i do a, a test shot strictly for composition um, so a very common exposure setting that i find works for getting milky way is about 6400 iso f 2.8 and 30 seconds so i get a lot of my shots off of that but when you're pointed in the dark, yeah, you can throw a little bit of flashlight or something in the foreground to make sure you got it in, but it's really hard to tell if you've got either too much foreground, too little, if you're cutting something off. So I go to the highest ISO setting that my camera has. So mine goes to 25,600 and then it has a high two. So it even adds more, but look at the difference. I can, I can do a test shot at high two and do a two second exposure. It's grainy, it's ugly, but I can look at it and say, okay, I, I don't have enough of the sky or I'm too far off to the left. It's just for composition purposes, shoot and reshoot. And you spend a lot less time, you know, waiting for that 30 seconds to finish to uh, set up your composition. And I might still use a flashlight or a cell phone to light up the foreground because I don't care about how it's going to actually look as a photo. I just want to see what it's capturing in, in the uh, frame. Okay. There's two types of uh, shots basically in uh, Milky Way, there's a single or a composite. So here's a single image I shot near St. George, Utah. And again, you can see the clouds on there. And that's a little bit of the city lights reflecting off it. So a single shot means you take one exposure for everything, you're done. It's got the Milky Way, it's got the foreground. And this one worked out good with a silhouette. So generally you're gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood for a single shot, depending on how dark the sky is, somewhere between 1600 and 6400 in ISO. You with the largest opening, whether it's 1.8, 4, 2.8. And again, you may not want to shoot there. You know, you'd have to know your lens if it's at the sharpest. 
And then it's the shutter speed. So ISO, let's say 32, 6400, uh, 2.8, what shutter speed do you use? So there's a couple of different ways to um, calculate this out. So back in the film days, there was what's called uh, the 600 rule. And it's basically 600 divided by the focal length and that gave you the exposure time. Then people started going digital and the 500 rule came about. The, the, more, the higher the resolution, the more you have to cut down the time. So at 500 millimeter, 14 millimeter lens would be 35 seconds or round it down 30 seconds, okay? Now, the problem with that is at 30 seconds, even at 14 millimeter, if you zoom in, if you start pixel peeping, you will see some streaking on the stars. There is movement. Um, the better rule is what they call the uh, NPF rule. It was invented by a Frederick uh, Macha. He's a French astronomer and a uh, um, amateur photographer. And basically the NPF stands ends for aperture, P for pixel density and F for focal length. And he came up with this very uh, complicated uh, rule to figure up a more accurate time so you have no movement on it. So the exact same shot that I would shoot at 14 millimeters at ISO 6400, 30 seconds, here I'd only get eight seconds. Now that's gonna be a sharper picture, but eight seconds, thats it's hard to get anything with eight seconds in a single shot. Chances are you're gonna have that ISO really cranked up. So you're sacrificing a noisier picture for something that's not streaky. I sell photos all the time, nobody ever notices. I mean, if you really, zoom in close, you'll see some star movement, but I think that the 500 ruler, if you can scale down a little bit from that and stay in a single shot, you can get away with it. Nobody's the wiser except you or maybe some other photographers that, you know, want to see how, how you did it. So take the test shots again, and some people do check their histogram. You don't want everything packed over on the left. You want something at least moving to the middle, and again, that's a little bit hard to see on, on a bright screen. I've gotten used to it, so I don't use the histogram anymore. I can pretty much tell what looks good after I'm shooting it, but uh, sometimes you get home and it wasn't the right exposure that you wanted, so, so keep an eye on that. Um, because it's a single shot, when you have a dark foreground, there's really only a couple of ways that you can add to it. That, that one I showed you with the Joshua tree back there, that was a silhouette, it worked out great, but if you want to eliminate it, you might have moonlight, but it has to just be a tiny sliver of moonlight and just on one of the horizons to work. If it's too bright, it's just going to, it's worse than light pollution. It's just going to blow it out. And it can actually move up right up to the Milky Way. And then there's artificial light. Some people use flashlights, strobes, or uh, low level lighting. So here's a shot I took at Dead Horse Point um, in um, near Canyonlands. It's a uh, my mind just went blank, uh, the name of the, it's a state park. And I shot a bunch of shots first, just trying to get long exposure to the foreground, just horrible, could not get anything. And then the moon came up um, from the horizon in the east and just a little bit of light on here, a touch of it. And you can see how it lights up that landscape. So that worked out really well. There's, there's no way I could have lit this with anything else, just too far away. And there's too much dust in the air. We tried that with flashlights and everything. It wasn't going to work, but the moonlight did perfect. So use it to your advantage if you can. And if you use artificial lighting, flashlights are how I started. That's where the term light painting originally came from. People will use it, but it's inconsistent. So you take a shot, didn't turn out great. You do the next one, you got some spots that are brighter than other spots. It's just very uneven. Um, you know, if you, I guess you put in enough time, you might get it to work, but it's not the ideal way. I've had to use strobe a, a couple of times in the past and you can tone it down, but it's really hard again to work with and you have to set up a wireless trigger. So technically works, but not the ideal. What most uh, nightscape photographers use is low level lighting. So this is what I use and, and I usually have, you know, two or sometimes more and you want this toned down all the way. 1% if your light will allow you to do it. So buy one that gives you that kind of adjustment. And, and don't forget the inverse square law. So, so the nice thing is about, you know, nightscapes is that all these principles apply if you're a studio or portrait photographer, the same thing happens. So the further away that you can move the light, the light drops off drastically. So you see if you had one meter, if that's the one to one, you go two meters, it's one fourth, three meters, one ninth. So you see that falling off a lot. And it's if you're not familiar with the inverse square law, if you look, you, you're you're seeing that you know 25 percent, you know, based on the fourth, and then three meters, that's one ninth. So you're squaring the the bottom number and inverting, and that's how you come up with the inverse square law. So 
I will actually have my lights typically placed way off to the side. And also, again, for anybody that's in portrait photography, you know, often use reflectors. Well, I don't bring a reflector out there, but many times I'll, I won't face the light at the subject. I'll look for a rock or something uh, or, or something big behind me and bounce it off of that. So that helps diffuse as well, because even 1% can be very uh, harsh if you, unless you're moving it too far away. Um, it's, it's not very bright to the naked eye at first. You almost have to get your eyes acclimated to dark even to see the 1%, but it shows up definitely in the photo. And that's again, taking a single shot. So, and think, you know, highlights and shadows, just like if you were shooting any of kind of, you know, landscape or ports or anything else. And a lot of times I'll warm it up. So there are lights that you can buy that have uh, color temperature on there. So instead of doing a, a blue or white, I will, uh, you know, make it a little bit warmer to just to add to the overall look of the picture. And the other thing that's important is that you don't want to set these on the ground because bushes, rocks, it casts a shadow. So try to raise them up, um, you know, have with you some uh, either stands, light stands, tripod or whatever. So here's a couple of lights. Here's one of the ones I own. It's called Loom Cube, very popular. Um, you can actually operate these with app to adjust them. I've never found that works very well. I bought them for that reason. I still use them, but I'm not a, a big fan of their, their Bluetooth app. It's just too slow and cumbersome. Um, here's another one you can get. And uh, there's a lot of versions like this. It's also made by Loom Cube. But this one, you can adjust. it's rechargeable. And you can adjust not only the intensity, but the uh, color balance as well. And then again, some sort of tripods or light stands. Draw back on the light stands. You can get it up there, but it, it you, you can't adjust the legs independently. So if you can't find a flat place to lay it down, then you're kind of off center and a little bit of wind and that may be toppling over. I've used like gorilla pods and attached them to tree branches and stuff before too. So you can get a lot of different angles and even a cheap tripod if you need one. Something like this, you can carry with you lightweight, but you can adjust the legs independently. And it's gonna require, like I said, a lot of fine tuning on the lighting. Like I said, the one I shot at Salt Flats, I had to keep running out there. And that's typical, it can take, the shot I uh, did of the um, hoodoo at the very beginning, I showed the Milky Way core in um, Hanksville. That took me two hours to get because of setting everything up and adjusting the lighting and trying to get the sharpness and everything else. So here's a shot in Bryce Canyon that I took a uh, year before last. And you can see the lights down at the bottom there. I hiked down the trail and set up the lights, then came back, take a test shot, go back down, readjust it, come up, take a test shot over and over again. Now, fortunately, the back wall, there were some other hikers that had turned on a light just when I was about to shoot this. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to use this to my advantage. So the very back wall, I had a little bit of light showing up from another, they weren't even photographers, but they had some night light going on. But the ones in the more the foreground, a lot of adjusting to get that. Um, I put the light sometimes in the building if there's an open door in a barn or something, or I'll put it on the opposite side and you shine in, you put it right up against the window from the outside and it'll bleed through and, and show up in there. And here's one where I actually had a light inside an old church and, uh, you know, used a little bit of light on the outside again there just so it wasn't completely black. And of course I showed you that one. So here I placed the lights to make sure that I could see the ridges. So you got to move these around so you get that texture, that three-dimensional look. You just don't want the, it's like using a flash on camera. It's just dull and bland. So move it off to the side. Think almost like in portraits. Um, here, as I was moving the light around, trying to find the right angle, I noticed that it cast these shadows towards my camera at an angle that complemented the Milky Way itself. So that's exactly where I set it up. And kind of uh, by accident that I discovered that and I like the way that it turned out. That's um, the northern end of the Salt Lake. And here's a white pocket. And I had, I think, two or three lights set up on this one, one on either side. Again, a lot of adjusting uh, back and forth, back and forth, looking not too bright, not too, uh, too dark, not hot spots. You want to get this stuff evened out. That's the other thing about low level lighting. It's, it's on continuously. The battery charge, so you might make sure you have a couple of them, but you turn on and it stays on. Where flashlight, it'd just be impossible to do a good job with something like that. This is probably my most challenging one that I shot because I didn't have enough lights to light up all these kilns. So this is in Wyoming and uh, I'm out there by myself and it's kind of, I don't wanna say it's a state park but there's little signs that tell about it and everything. And so I had to actually do this in layers. And so I did, I think three kilns at a time, light it up, get the correct exposure and then move the lights over to the other three. And, and again, back and forth, back and forth, hours of working this, to make sure that I got an equal amount of light in the other three kilns.
So that's one of the advantages of summer shooting, which we'll talk about is that you can, you know, have that time to do it. So single shot, check your foreground and your sky to make sure they're both sharp and they're both going to be grainy because you have to, you can only shoot at one ISO if you're doing a single shot. The foreground um, may not be as sharp as you want because if you're shooting at 1.8 or 2.8, depending on where your subject's at, you may have too shallow of a depth of field to get it. Okay. So what happens if you don't have a, a depth of field to get the shot? Well, you could, if you focus, you're focused at infinity, you can use photo pills and other calculator and figure out where does my, my depth of field start? What's the closest? And hopefully your subject falls into that one. I've had other people that say they'll do a hyperfocal length and so, or distance. You set the hyperfocal distance that, that includes your foreground and sky. I don't like that because that it leads to what they call acceptably sharp. And, and I find that it's just not sharp enough on the stars. So I, I personally don't uh, like to use the hyperfocal distance setting. Um, and then, of course, you're going to need noise reduction. You can do it in a light room. My favorite is Topaz Denoise. I actually own On One No Noise. Sometimes I'll use that. It, occasionally, it'll do better than Topaz. DxO Prime, I have an older version, not too bad on that one as well. But because you'll be at you know, probably 3,200, 6,400, whatever, um, definitely some software to reduce the noise is good. So the advantage to a single is that it's quick and fast. Um, you know, you, you can, you're there, you're not there very long if it's cold or something. Um, and it's, it's great, you know, to be able to shoot right where you're at and, and be done with it if you, that's what you want. Disadvantage is that it's going to be grainier and you may have the shallow depth of field problem. And what happens if you don't have the moon out or don't have low level lights? Um, in Utah, many of the national parks will not allow you to light paint at all. So that shot that I showed you, actually this one right here, of delicate arch, I shot that before um, they outlawed it. So now you get a ticket. You can be in trouble if you light anything up with any kind of light painting. And so, what what would I do if there's no moon? What would I do if I want to be able to get this? Where you know you would be able to see the bottom in a silhouette. So that presents a challenge with a single shot. Okay, so that's pretty much asking the question there. If it's too dark or you need the more depth of field. So if you increase the aperture to increase the depth of field, then it's darker. You just get more grain or or longer time. So the only solution is you have to take a shot for the sky and another shot for the foreground, basically a composite. So you're, you're doing one of each, okay? Um, compositing, a lot of people, that's almost like a swear word, but everybody does compositing. If you're doing layers and, and doing any kind of HDR or anything else, it's a composite. So dictionary.com says that it's made up of disparate or separate parts of elements of a compound. So if you're combining anything, technically that's a, a composite. I have uh, friends that say, I don't do any compositing, but okay, you did do different exposures from them, you just different frames. So technically that that qualifies. So I, I, don't, I don't see it as a bad word. In compositing, there's basically four types that I use and sometimes there's overlap on this. We have stacked, tracked, blended, and pano. Um, and so you combine it. So you could do the sky as a stack tractor panel. We're going to get to each one of these. And then you can do the foreground. Either there's a single stack panel or a blend. So it's just two different uh, exposures or two different, ultimately, frames that you're combining, but you could do different things on, on each one. So for stacked, that means basically that you shoot a, a lot of shots. I, I find that 10 seems to be kind of the magic number. So if you set up your camera, and you shoot 10 shots. So if you look at an example here, let's suppose you're at 3,200 ISO, 30 seconds, 2.8, crank it up to 12,800 ISO at only eight seconds. You take 10 of them. Well, when you blend this together in software, it'll help get rid of that noise. So that's a huge advantage to getting the sky looking good. Um, and because the sky is moving though, in the shot over those 10 frames, you're you can't have the sky lined up and the foreground lined up at the same time. It's not going to happen. So you have to basically separate them. Now you could still do this in a single frame and you could do the, the foreground in its own um, layer that you're going to blend together in Photoshop and do the sky in another layer, but it's still a composite. There are different software programs that will let you stack the sky. There's uh, Sequator, Starry Landscape stack, Stacker, and you can do it in Photoshop as well. So basically it's combining again those 10 frames, layering on top of each other, and it uh, can drastically reduce the noise for the sky. And it's, even for the foreground, it'll uh, reduce the noise on that. Okay, um, You could illuminate the foreground and just use the stack part 
for the sky if you want. Like I said, you can kind of combine these things. So here's one that I did stacked and that it's actually in the Tetons driving over the bridge. And I saw this from the window while we're driving, you can see the Milky Way, that's just how dark it was out there. So we hopped out, we're right there on the bridge and I shot, I think it was 10 frames on this one. I stacked the foreground and stacked the sky and then blended them together. Um, there's the shot I showed you earlier. And so I'm stacked the sky, that was 10 frames, but the foreground is a single frame with the light on there. The best place to find instructions on stacking, go to lonelyspec.com. He talks about the different software, how to use them. Don't have time to get to it in this uh, um, presentation today, but that's the place to go to learn how to do stacking. So the advantage is it's less grainy. It's even less grainy than using the noise reduction software. I actually did that test while I shot that last uh, um, one in Hanksville that you just saw. I, I tried it at lower ISOs with noise reduction, tried stacking and stacking did look better. Disadvantage, it takes more time to shoot and more time in post-processing. You gotta have Photoshop knowledge, gotta learn you know, how to stack them or use um, Starry Sky or something else along with it. And it's a, it's a big challenge if um, you have stuff sticking up in the sky. And, and before I show you a picture on that one, um, if you don't use low level lighting, you'll get a less grainy foreground, but you also lose detail. So stacking the foreground, kind of works, but it's not the ideal one. So here's one, this is actually a single shot, but I wanted to use it as an example of where it'd be hard to do a stack because how are you gonna separate out that windmill from the background? You know, I mean, you can do it, but boy, that's a lot of work trying to mask it out and have two separate layers. Um, like I said, if you follow, if you're shooting that sky is moving, when you blend them together and auto align them, that uh, windmill is no longer lined up properly. So that's one of the challenges of stacking. Okay, so let's go on to tracking. Now, I'm not going to talk about the deep sky tracking, which you definitely can use to get the shot, but I bought what's called the Move Shoot Move, and it's a little almost pocket size one. It fits on your ball head, and then you add a second ball head onto it. And if you're not doing deep sky, if you're doing a wide angle lens, it's accurate enough. It, it's not 100%. It comes with a laser pointer that you point at the North Star, and you can do long exposures, and it's moving with the sky. So here's one I did at Capitol Reef. And so the, that's, that's a, um, a tracked image. In fact, this one was, I think, about eight minutes, about eight minutes long uh, for the sky. And in the foreground, I uh, will get to what I did on that one. But um, because it's moving with it, you're going to get a long exposure. You can calculate how long do I need the exposure. In photo pills, you type it in. Okay, so you know what was my exposure? 6400, 2.8 to 30 seconds. What am I going to need here if I if I go, um, you know, f4 and if I want ISO 400 or whatever? So that gives a difference. Um, so like stacked, you want to be able to, uh, you have to separate. In fact, you have to separate because it's moving. The, the track is moving in the sky. So none of the foreground is going to show up. You can't get it in the same shot. So you, you have to be level. You have to make sure that you do a foreground in a, set, in a separate shot, which you could do with lights. You could do a stack pen or whatever you want foreground, even with a tracked sky. The advantage to tracking is the cleanest of all. You will get the, the best looking stars, the lowest grain, um, like I said, you can shoot at maybe 400 ISO, uh, maybe 800, 200, I guess, even if you're willing to spend the time with it. Um, very low grain, looks great. So yeah, here's a, an example of the shot. If I might do 30 seconds, 6,400, I think that last shot I did at 400 ISO, eight minutes long. And PhotoPills has all that to calculate, tell you where you're at on there. The disadvantages, most time consuming, took eight minutes. And then what if I didn't like it for some reason? You start all over again. You have to set it up. You have to align it. If you don't do it alignment right, you're going to get streaking on there. There's a bit of a learning curve. There's a little bit more to carry because you're carrying that piece plus another ball head on there. And, you know, the first time I did it, it was very awkward setting it up. Now that I've done it a few times, I'm more comfortable with it. If you bump the tripod, you got to start all over with a new alignment and everything else. So that could be a pain. And you have the same problems with compositing. So if that windmill was in the sky, you did a track, how are you going to get rid of that windmill? It, it can be very challenging from that aspect. Okay, so let's talk about the second to last one here, blending, and, and blending is kind of what you do in the other ones, but I'm, I'm using a specific uh, um, uh, definition here. So the sky could be single, stacked, or tracked. Foreground could be a long exposure, illuminated exposure, or a blue hour exposure. So if you do the foreground and a long exposure, you, you might do uh, a two-minute, five-minute, ten-minute exposure to get enough, maybe just from starlight to get the shots. So you can do that at most uh, the cameras 
problem is that you could get hot pixels. So here's a shot. I don't know if this shows up well on the screen here. It's one I shot in Zion. And I, it was probably about an eight to 10 minute exposure in the middle of summer, it was in June. So the heat already adds to the graininess and the chance of the, uh, the hot pixels. And you can see all those dots in there. They can be cleaned up in Photoshop, but boy, that's a lot of work. So the way to get around that, if you do um, a long exposure is, is you turn on um, um, long exposure noise reduction. So it takes the shot, and then basically it's like taking another shot kind of with a lens cap on a non-exposure. So it doubles the time. If you did a 10 minute exposure, you're now 20 minutes, but the second shot repeats it without actually exposing it. And then the camera looks to see where are the hot pixels and they're the same spot on both of them and it gets rid of it. It actually does a really good job um, with if you don't have the light, okay? Drawback is, you know, if you do a stacked one, it's less sharp. If you do the long exposure uh, noise reduction, it takes a long time. So blue hour is one of the ideal ones. So the trick to this one is, and it works a little bit better in spring um, because it comes right after sunset, is you set up your camera, get your shot. And as it gets darker in blue hour, you take the shot and then don't move the tripod. You wait for the uh, night sky to illuminate and you take another shot. And so again, you're using different layers and you're blending the two different exposures together. But that allows you now all of a sudden to use 5.6 or F8 at a lower ISO so you get less noise in the foreground, cleaner, and then you might still want to stack the sky or use a tracker for the sky. So here's one I shot down to white pocket. And same thing here, I shot this one just as blue hour was starting to fade away. I got the shot and then I waited. I, I probably had to wait another hour, I'm guessing, before I got the Milky Way to look how it was there, but just kept my tripod waiting and then uh, take another shot. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky in compositing. Some people say you're not allowed to use move your tripod. I have other people that claim they don't don't do compositing. They're like, yeah, but I want to. I'll take us one step over to the left, and now I don't have to mask out the tree when I do the next one because uh, I'm able to get a little bit higher ground and shoot the Milky Way there. So you have to decide what you know works for for you that you feel comfortable with on the level of compositing. But uh, basically, either way, you're still combining two different shots together. And I think it works well. It's one of my favorite ways to do it. So cleanest foreground, sharpest, less noise. You use a higher f-stop. And you don't necessarily need the lights because you got the blue hour doing it. So sometimes you do use the lights. So this is a, um, a composite I did without moving the tripod. Um, so I, I wanted to shoot the lights inside this old building uh, front and back. I needed depth of field to get there. There's no way I could get this at 2.8. So I took the exposure at probably about F8 with some lights and then took a 2.8 exposure without moving the camera to get the Milky Way. And it's just a matter of layering like you do anything else in uh, Photoshop. Okay, so advantages, blue hour. It's great near sunrise and sunset. The drawback is that what if you take your blue hour shot and it's several hours before you get the Milky Way? So again, do, do you uh, go sit in your car? Do you leave the camera? Do you fold it up and bring it back and shoot? That's up to you. But that's you know the issue everybody has to deal with when they're doing some sort of blend like that. Last one is pano. Uh, with a pano, which is like any daylight pano, you go you know right to left or left to right. You shoot multiple shots. You can't do that tracked. You can't do that with. Uh, it won't follow, and really, you don't want to do the long exposure noise reduction because it's too long. You, you do, you know, double the time for each frame. That Milky Way has moved a ton by the time you get to the last frame. If you shoot vertically, you can get more height than it. So, if your subject foreground subject is bigger, that works great. Usually, when I'm doing a pano, I go to a little bit higher focal length. I might do about 20 millimeter. That makes uh, enlarges the foreground, makes the the barn or the tree or anything look a little bit bigger. Um, and I can get the Milky Way still into it. So shooting verticals like that. If you can get in horizontal, though, it will reduce the number of shots you take. So less time and you're able to shoot more. Try to get about a 50% overlap and make sure you get an extra frame on either side. Because when you start cropping, there's nothing worse than cropping right up against the, the core, maybe even losing part of it because you cut it off too soon. And make sure you give yourself plenty of room at top and bottom for the cropping as well. And make sure, like any pano, that it's, it's uh, level and you want continuous lighting. That's very important here to do continuous lighting um, because you can't light it up and then next frame it's a, at a different one. Um, and the files are very large when you do those panos. And so sometimes you might want to use a lower panoramic if you can do it. Okay, so to get the arch, 
March to May is usually when the arch is between 20 to 25 degrees, which is kind of the sweet spot. You can go higher than that, but then there's a bigger separation. So that one was, I think, in May right there. But if we move later to the year, that pretty soon there's a bigger gap between the foreground and the arch. So here's when I shot later in the year, and that's actually the Great Salt Lake, and there, that's Tooele, a town nearby that are shot in a, in a really high arch. I'm probably pushing the envelope for that one, but it still worked out okay. Uh, this was actually, we're going to the Tetons here. That's a uh, um, in, in place called Mormon Row. And again, maybe slightly late on this one, but didn't turn out too bad. One of the places you can no longer uh, do light painting. So you get a ticket if you try to do that. Um, and then in post-processing, um, adjust the, the you know, white balance to taste. Um, usually somewhere between black or blue, I think it looks best, but it's whatever you like. You might need to stack, obviously layering for the composites. If you know how to use luminosity masks, that can help out a great deal in bringing out the color and detail in that galactic core. And even if I do stacked um, or tracking, I might still try some noise reduction software on there to see if it can help out my image better. So, so that's my presentation. I know I, I burned through, hopefully, uh, um, time to give some questions, my email address, and I give, I'll give. i end it there with a link tree in case uh, somebody wants to check out um, the site. So Wow. So th thank you, Mike. Um, I have to first say I had no idea my little brother knew so much about photography. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a good thing it was recorded. People can go back and watch probably some of those things over and over again. Um, I, of course, will expect a personalized workshop. Um, so I think we have time, Bruce, for some questions. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can go ahead and take a few questions. Uh, anybody out there have anything they want to ask Mike while we've got him here? Yeah, I have I'll tell a you question. what, I like that you mentioned uh, you they deal with the Milky they, they deal with the Milky Way. Um, do they deal with other subjects in addition to the Milky Way? Does who deal with the other subjects? I'm sorry. The, 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 the apps that you mentioned, do they deal with oh, other subjects other than the Milky Way? Yes, yes, exactly. So um, photo pills, it'll show you when the moon's out, the angle, it, it'll show you the sun as far as rise and setting. So photo pills covers it all. So whether you're trying to get sunrise shots, sunset shots, you want to line up the moon with a particular, uh, you know, rock or building on the horizon, all of that's in there. I mean, you, you could do the, it has a, a daylight augmented reality as well. So you can see where's, when is the sun going to set? When is it going to touch down on that mountain or hoodoo? So all of it, it likes it for $10. It's, I mean, it's amazing that it's not 10 bucks a year or 20 bucks a year. I, I pay it because it's a fantastic uh, app. Um, we I'm had another Mike. question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Mike. Uh, great presentation. I really appreciated it. Uh, but I was a little surprised that you talked about the fact that light painting is being outlawed. And I kind of trying to understand the rationale for uh, the authorities to uh, do that. Uh, is there yeah. something you understand? Well, there's, there's been a number of reasons given. What's unfortunate, a lot of those uh, that are outlawed in Utah, and it's by the same uh, people that run each one of the parks or are involved in it. And so you got a couple of people that are very bothered by it. So part of the reason was that uh, they, they say that it, it, ruins night, it ruins the night vision for other people that aren't doing astrophotography. They go out there and you got a bunch of people with lights and so it ruins for them. The other thing, there's actually been fights there's been fights at some of these locations like at Delicate Arch, where it's like, it's my turn to light it, it's not, you know, and so people, you know, fist fights and police called and everything. So there's been some weird things like that. Um, and in the Tetons is they say that it's because they're worried about disturbing wildlife, which is weird, though, too, because you can hike around with a headlamp on, which is way brighter than a low level lighting, but you can't suddenly turn that headlamp on something you're shooting. So um, it, the people that do nightscape workshops around here have been, you know, up in arms and very frustrated by it. Uh, and they can kind of see with the flashlights because it's very bright and you know, shine at other people. But the low level lighting, it's barely it's it's less than the moon um, in the illumination. But, yeah, you, you have some people that are in charge of different parks that and I think that they're not really photographers. And so they see it. In, in one direction and don't allow it. We keep hoping that's gonna change, but it is right now what it is. So. Okay, I understand. It sounds like they uh, 
don't want to deal with the uh, rashes associated with the uh, irritating people and people irritating one another. Yeah. Do you ever teach workshops? Um, at some point, I hope to. I don't now just because my uh, my full-time job that pays the bills keeps me pretty busy. I, I have a hard enough time getting vacation time to go shooting myself. So yeah, not, not yet. Maybe in a couple of years, I can uh, scale down on my regular job and start doing them. Karen, I try to tell him, I think he could actually do better doing workshops and things than he could with his uh, <laughs> camera sales job personally, but he's not giving it up yet. Keep us posted, Steve. Thank you. Now, yeah. could you um, talk a little bit more about uh, the fact that the bigger pixels on a lower resolution camera are doing better at night and on low light situations? Yeah, so, so the, the theory is, and like I said, I've, I've read mixed reports about this, but but basically, um, because the pixels are light buckets, and, and the bigger the buckets, the more light they collect. And so that's one reason stepping up to full frame, you get a bigger sensor. Well, going from 46 megapixels to 24 megapixels, you have less pixels on there. Each one of those pixels are larger. And so it, it should be less grainy when you go to the higher S. It should be a little bit cleaner. Now, I don't know if there's other things going on than that, but that's always been kind of the... Uh, the argued assumption and the tests that I've seen, I haven't tried this myself, but the reports that I've seen comparing the Z62 at 24 megapixel and the Z72 at 46 megapixel is the, the 62 at lower megapixel is a little bit cleaner at those uh, higher ISOs. Now, often I will use my 72, the higher megapixel, because I, I may want to blow this up to a 40 by 60 or something else. And so, um, with stacking or tracking or some of the uh, noise reduction softwares that's out there, I don't know if if there's enough difference for me to to go down to the lower megapixel. But that's like I said, in theory, what's what uh, many people claim is happening. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions out there this evening from Mike? Okay, then, um, hearing none, uh, Mike, thanks again for the very interesting presentation. A lot of information packed in there. And um, if you missed anything and want to go back, it's be on our YouTube channel here. You, you can see it again. But again, awesome. thanks, Mike, and thank you all for attending tonight uh, from Photo Society. Thanks for having me. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Good thank night, everyone. Good night. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks.